Hey, I'm Nick Braun. Today I'm going to tell you about why the quantum hardware looks the way it does and what it means for the future of this industry. And then I'm going to show you what I consider to be the most important graph in quantum computing. In November of 2021, IBM released the 127 qubit Eagle processor, which we have a picture of here. And this is arranged in something we call a heavy hexagonal lattice. In today's video, I'd like to tell you why we arrange our qubits in something called a heavy hex lattice and what it means for quantum error correction. In addition to that, I'd like to highlight another capability of the IBM quantum backends called mid-circuit measurement that we can use today to show you how to do quantum error detection on this heavy hex lattice. While this depiction of the Eagle processor doesn't look hexagonal, we can revisualize it in this way. Here we have three hexagons, and we have qubits on the vertices of each of those hexagons. What makes this lattice heavy is we also have a qubit between each one of those vertices. Vertices. <laughs> I don't know why I'm giggling. This means we have 12 qubits in each one of these rings. There are a number of physical motivations for the co-design behind this lattice, but let me highlight two of them. First, it is important to realize that IBM utilizes fixed frequency qubits. And because of the nature of our two qubit operation, we need those qubits to be addressable in frequency. By slightly reducing the connectivity of a square lattice, we can reduce the errors caused by frequency collisions. This can also help us in reducing spectator errors, a type of crosstalk. Decreases in these kinds of errors allow us to increase gate fidelity and thereby also increase quantum volume. We'll talk about quantum volume in another video. In this video, we'll explore a quantum error correction code that's admitted by the heavy hex lattice. The heavy hex code is a hybrid between the surface code and the Bacon Shore code. This means the heavy hex lattice is compatible with the construction of a universal fault tolerant quantum computer. In today's noisy quantum computers, the qubits have very high error rates. What quantum error correction does is it takes a number of physical qubits and constructs a logical qubit from them. In this system, some of the physical qubits are used to store quantum information, while others are used to detect errors. Basically, the heavy hex code is as simple as this. Ha! Just kidding! We'll take it apart piece by piece and code it up in Qiskit. First, let's import the necessary libraries. We're going to run this on an actual quantum backend. We're going to use the 16-qubit IBM Cube Guadalupe. We'll use a paper by IBM on the heavy hex code as a guide, and there's a link to that paper in the description below. Many quantum error correction codes work by measuring the parity of quantum states. Because measuring quantum states themselves tends to destroy the quantum information, measuring the parity allows us to extract just the errors that happened while tending to stabilize the quantum state themselves. Basically, there are two kinds of quantum errors that need to be corrected. There are bit flips, which we also call X errors, and phase flips, which we also call Z errors. By measuring an even number of qubits at a time, we can extract the parity and figure out if an error occurred and where it occurred. This is very similar to an MD5 checksum you might be familiar with if you download large files. Let's start with the bit flips. This is the surface code-like part of the heavy hex code. Here we're measuring the XXXX, that's four X's parity operator, and we're going to do this on a subset of seven qubits. Here we have the quantum information stored in the data qubits, labeled one through four, and we want to map those errors onto the flag qubits, labeled five and six, and then map that further to the ancilla qubit, labeled seven. Here we're only going to measure the flag and ancilla qubits, because we want to preserve the quantum information stored in the data qubits. Note also that the ancilla qubit number seven is prepared in the plus state and measured in the X basis, whereas normally superconducting qubits are measured in the Z basis. Here we create a quantum circuit with a seven qubit quantum register and a three qubit classical register, representing the measurements from just the ancilla and flag qubits we're going to measure. We'll start by resetting all the qubits that we measure, then we'll put the ancilla qubit in a Hadamard state, then do a series of C knots, and then in order to do the X measurement of the ancilla qubit, we do another Hadamard because we'll measure in the Z basis. That gives us a circuit that looks like this. We actually want to create a method called check X that will do this for us when we construct the whole circuit. We can comment and uncomment and add a barrier so that the X circuit doesn't overlap with the Z circuit. This consists of mapping the Z parity in pairs of two to the new ancillas that were the flag qubits in the XXXX measurement. We'll do this twice, but to the same data qubits as before. So now we'll create a quantum circuit that has a quantum register of seven qubits and now a classical register of two qubits for measuring our ancillas. We'll reset those ancillas, do a series of C knots, and measure in the Z basis. And this is the circuit we get. Now we'll comment out the things we don't need and make a method for the check Zs. Lastly, we need to initialize our code state, which is the quantum information we wish to preserve. In this case, a four qubit GHZ state. This state is an eigenstate of both the XXXX and pairs of ZZ measurements. 
also known as stabilizers. We can do this by doing a Hadamard on qubit 0, followed by a series of C-naughts. Uncommenting and recommenting what we do and don't need, we can create a method that does this. I should note that this initial state preparation is not fault tolerant, meaning errors can occur and propagate. A more fault tolerant way to prepare the initial state is to measure stabilizers from some product state. Putting it all together, we'll do two rounds of quantum error correction on our 7 qubit quantum register. Here, the number of bits in the classical register is going to depend on the number of rounds we're doing, because each round has five mid circuit measurements per round. Mid circuit measurements are an advanced feature of IBM quantum backends that allow us to measure the quantum states inside of a quantum circuit. Next, we'll construct a method that does the check X and check Z parities for the number of rounds we choose. And then we measure the remaining qubits at the end. Initializing our code state and then performing the check rounds gives us this circuit. Pretty advanced, eh? In fact, it's so advanced it doesn't fit on this page. <laughs> now let's check and make sure we did a good job by running it on a perfect quantum simulator. We'll use the IBM Q Chasm Simulator which will take a moment, but it's pretty quick. Now let's plot our results. We can see the last four digits of each one of these bit strings is either 0, 0, 0, 0, or 1, 1, 1, 1, corresponding to the four qubit GHZ state. All the other qubits were used to detect errors, and since we're running on a perfect quantum simulator, there were no such errors, so all the other digits are 0. Now we want to run this on an actual quantum backend, but before we can do that, we need to transpile the circuit which converts the circuit from an abstract circuit to something that can run on our native backend, given its connectivity and basis gate set. It's similar to compilation, but it transforms a circuit to another circuit. We discussed transpilation in another video. Quantum error correction codes respect the physical layout of the lattice, which means we shouldn't incur any additional c knots when we map our circuit to the heavy hex lattice. So on IBM Q Guadalupe, the qubits are numbered like this. Let's use the transpiler to figure out an initial mapping for us and see if it works for the rest of the circuit. We'll look at the X check first. By running the check X circuit through the transpiler at optimization level 3, we can see that we didn't incur any extra C naughts because the transpiler did a good job. And we can confirm that those numbers of C naughts stayed at 8 by printing out the number of C naughts in both the abstract and the transpiled circuit. Our initial layout here, we see the mapping goes from 0 to 10, 10, 1, 2, 6, 6, 2 to 0, 0. 3, 2, 2, 4 to 1, 5 to 7, and finally 6 to 4. So this will be our initial layout that we want to enforce on our other qubits. Next, we want to check that this optimized layout still respects the connectivity for our Z parity checks. Looking good with 4 C naughts still, and confirming that we had 4 C naughts in the abstract circuit. So this is a good initial layout. Now the problem arises when we try to do the same thing with our code state. Look at all those extra swaps generated. Those CNOTs are going to cause extra error, so we're going to try and generate this in a smarter way. So since we want to be smarter, let's look and see how the transpiler mapped our circuit to the backend. Here we can see the mapped qubits on the actual physical layout of IBM Q Guadalupe. What we can notice is that we can start generating entanglement from the middle qubit, which is qubit 6 in this case. Then we can spread it out and then undo the entanglement we don't need. So here's what we do. Let's create a 7 qubit GHZ state, and we can do it with this circuit that respects the connectivity of IBM Q Guadalupe. We can transpile that and see that we didn't incur any extra C naughts, so we did a good job. Now by adding a few extra C naughts, we can undo the entanglement we don't need, which is on the ancilla and the flag qubits. We get that. And just to make sure that we did things right, we can use the state vector library from the quantum info module to confirm that the state vector we get from initializing our quantum circuit in both ways is identical. We'll discuss the quantum info module in a separate video. We'll take all those gates together and combine them in a method we call code state init heavy hex. Now let's put it all together. We'll do two rounds of quantum error correction just as we did before, but with a different preparation of the code state. Transpiling this circuit, we can see we didn't incur any more C naughts because we respected the layout of the device. It's always a good idea to do a little bit extra simulation to make sure you constructed your circuit correctly. Let's go ahead and run on the perfect simulator again and make sure we replicate what we did before. This is kind of like a sanity check. Now let's look at the counts we got back, and we can see indeed that we measured our 000 or 111 corresponding to the 4 qubit GHZ state 
and we see that we incurred no errors because all the other digits are zero. Let's do some further simulation by doing a noisy simulation provided by Kiskit Air using an air model derived from fake Guadalupe. Looking at the counts now, we can see a lot more things have happened. Here we can see we're usually getting the 000 or 111 state showing up, which shows we preserved our GHZ state, but now we've introduced noise. We can see that we've actually measured quantum errors as reflected in the ones in place of the zeros in the first classical register. We can also see that we didn't always get the 0000 or 1111 as we'd expect from a four qubit GHZ state. Now let's get the results from an actual quantum device. This code will execute on the real Guadalupe, but I'm gonna pull the results from a job that's already been run. So we'll comment these things out. And uncomment our job. Let's calculate the logical error rates from this experiment. Our logical operators correspond to parity, so we'll consider the parity of the ZZZZ measurements, i.e. just the bit flips. Just considering the outputs without the results of error detection, we get a raw logical error rate of 41.4%. Yikes. But I should mention by raw logical error rate, I mean here we have not used fault tolerant initial state preparation or decoded the logical states, so this will be a bit higher than normal. How about if we throw away results whenever we detect a bit flip error? In this case, we improve our logical error rate to 38.1%, slightly better. Also note that we're only using 20% of our shots. This shows the value in being able to also correct the errors that we detect. Now let's talk about what I think is the most important graph in quantum computing, and that's the relationship between the physical error rate and the logical error rate. Given a certain physical error rate and a certain size of qubits, given by the depth of the error correction code, we can surmise what the logical error rate that we get out of it. Because this is a hybrid one, those are gonna be true and different between the X errors and the Z errors. For the surface code-like part of the heavy hex code, which corrects for bit flips, that's a thresholded code, which means we get an advantage as long as we're below a certain error rate. In this case, that's 0.0045 or 0.45%. Here, if we look at a depth three heavy hex code, we can see what the logical error rate is and we can see that that goes down as a function of physical error rates. Now what happens is if we use deeper and deeper depth error correction codes, we can push that logical rate down further, which means we have resources that we can use in terms of physical qubits to reduce the logical error rate of our logical qubits. And it's this trade-off that is gonna be a big part of where we are now with noisy quantum systems and where we will be in the future with fault-tolerant error corrected systems. We can see the same thing in the bacon short part of the heavy hex code, only that this is not a thresholded code, so there is no dotted vertical line. Given this kind of information, we know the physical resources that we actually have, and we can produce the logical error rates from them, which allows us to ascertain what kinds of quantum algorithms we'll actually be able to run in the future. I should also mention that these results were obtained using fault tolerant logical state preparation and implemented using a flag decoder, which improves the results over the somewhat simplified way we did them. There was a lot to unpack in this video. If there's anything you'd like us to look deeper into, please let us know in the comments. I've been your host, Nick Braun. Thanks for watching.